what a long module this one's turned out to be, but God, how fascinating can it be? Oh, I just get all excited thinking about it. I want to wrap up our look at chemical shifts with a little bit of, on the solvents we use in NMR spectroscopy. It pains me, breaks my heart really, that in an online format, uh, none of you are going to be able to actually make up any samples or play with some of these solvents. But I would be remiss if we didn't talk at least a little bit about the NMR solvents that we commonly use and some of the other details of, of how they get used and things you have to think about when you make use of them. All solvents we use in NMR spectroscopy are usually classic organic solvents but in their deuterated versions. Uh, instead of CHCl3 for normal chloroform we use CDCl3 where the regular H1 regular hydrogen has been replaced with deuterium H2. We do that simply because there are a million solvent molecules for every one sample, and when we take our spectra, we really aren't interested in looking at those million solvent molecules. We want to look at the sample molecules only. We don't want our signals to be overwhelmed by so much solvent. So we replace all of the hydrogens with deuterium. Deuterium, remember, it's a magnetic nucleus, but with a much different magnetogyric ratio than, than regular proton. It does not uh, change its spin states at 400 megahertz, and so essentially in a proton spectrum, deuterium is invisible. And so this is a way to get our solvents and not have to look at them in our spectrum. And remember, since it's an isotopic substitution, uh, the you know, a solvent like deuterated benzene is nonpolar in its hydrogen form, nonpolar in its deuterated form. Whatever dissolves in regular benzene dissolves in deuterated benzene. The same thing is true for chloroform or DMSO, acetone, water, or any other deuterated solvent you might wish to use. It was common in the early days of NMR to use a solvent like carbon tetrachloride, CCl4, that has no proton in it, but that one is rather expensive, it's difficult to work with, it is also uh, quite uh, uh, toxic and nasty to work with, so its use has fallen by the wayside and we use the uh, deuterated versions of most common solvents instead. Here are some pictures of various uh, bottles of deuterated solvents. The first one shows uh, water, uh, D2O, you here are called deuterium oxide, and deuterated chloroform, CDCl3. Notice the numbers on the bottle of D2O, deuterium oxide. Its molecular weight is not 18 grams per mole, it's 20, and its melting point and its boiling point and its density are all a little bit different than you would expect from water. Here are some other deuterated solvents uh, that are commonly used in the lab. Uh, DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, is, is used uh, because of its polar nature. Uh, acetonitrile uh, and deuterated acetone are quite commonly used as well. One issue with NMR solvents is uh, many of them tend to pick up water out of the atmosphere. If you, if you looked at the D2O bottle picture, it does have the word hygroscopic on it, meaning it, is, it picks up H2O out of the atmosphere pretty readily. And as soon as that happens, the hydrogens and deuterium start exchanging places with each other, and you end up with uh, a, a fair amount of HOD in, in your bottle, water in deuterated water, essentially. And so you sometimes can find solvents in these sealed ampules. These things are, are, you know, the only way to get at it is to break the glass. There's no lid on there. So you use it right before, you open it right before you need it. Um, but it does have the advantage of this solvent is never going to evaporate away uh, that it as it might in a bottle. If you're not really careful and seal those bottles well, um, and leave the lid loose, uh, it will slowly evaporate and it's rather depressing to spend a fair amount of money on a 10 milliliter bottle of deuterated acetone and slowly but surely have it evaporate away into the atmosphere. You will also note on many of the bottles little numbers that say things like 99.6% D or something related like that. 
that's the manufacturer telling you how good of a job they did in replacing every one of the regular hydrogens, the protons, with a deuterium. They're good, but they're not perfect. And so there's always a trace of CHCl3, for example, in your bottle of CDCl3. It's called the residual solvent signal. You've actually seen uh, that on the table I took from that Journal of Organic Chemistry article that I showed uh, in the previous video. There I was calling your attention to the position of water in various solvents. Here it is again, and notice this line labeled residual solvent signal. For example, that trace of CHCl3 in a deuterated chloroform bottle, that, you know, point one or 0.2 percent that's in there will show up as a peak at 7.26 ppm. Notice how strongly downfield that is because of the three electronegative chlorines attached to the same carbon that bears the proton. When I've shown the methyl ethyl ketone standard spectra, for example, it's usually looked like this where I've you know, shown only the peaks of interest. But if you take a look at the uh, wider range of the spectrum, you do see there is a little peak down there at 7.26 ppm. It's a residual solvent signal, and in fact, it's going to be sitting there in every single uh, chloroform uh, sample that you might run. If you run in uh, D2O, you're going to see residual solvent signal at around 4.6 ppm. If you run in any of these solvents, you are going to see the residual solvent signal in there. And in fact, these days, the residual solvent signals are often used in place of TMS for referencing our spectrum. TMS really is not used that often anymore. I myself have not used it in, in a couple of decades. Uh, the modern instruments are powerful enough that we can see these residual solvent signals very nicely. And so what we do instead of using TMS, we say in chloroform, TMS is exactly zero ppm. The chloroform, the CHCl3, in amongst all the CDCl3 shows up at 7.26 ppm. And so we use that, the 7.26 ppm residual solvent signal as our reference standard. And so we do that for almost all of our NMR solvents. You even see this in the literature sometimes. Here's a little fragment of an article that I use in some of my other classes uh, from the journal Organometallics, but I just simply point out they're telling you right here in the journal article how they did their referencing, and it's usually to the residual solvent signal. You do the same thing with carbon spectra. Every one of these solvents except for water has a carbon in there. And so instead of putting in TMS and calling it zero ppm in our carbon, we say the carbons of chloroform are at 77 ppm, okay, which they are 77 ppm downfield from TMS. We use that as our reference standard. And so all of the uh, organic solvents have a carbon in them, they are commonly used as reference standards. D2O is unique this way in that there is no carbon in there. And so if you ever have to do uh, a molecule that will only dissolve in water and it has carbon and you must measure very accurately your chemical shifts in carbon, it is not uncommon to have uh, other materials or find D2O with other additives in it uh, that give you a carbon signal that you can use as an internal reference standard. Finally, I'll simply make mention of this. Your choice of solvent is kind of an interesting one. Uh, chloroform is one of the cheapest of the deuterated solvents, so it gets used a lot. It is polar, but it's not a hydrogen bonder, and so there are a fair number of molecules that you might want to study that will not dissolve in chloroform. That's where some of the other more polar solvents, but also more expensive solvents, come into play. DMSO, for example, dimethyl sulfoxide, is often called a highly polar but aprotic solvent. Aprotic simply meaning, it, meaning it's not a hydrogen bond donor. And so DMSO will not do any proton deuterium exchange. Some samples will only dissolve in a hydrogen bonding solvent like deuterated methanol or even water. For example, in a few modules from now, we're going to do a full spectral analysis on sucrose, sugar, a carbohydrate. It ain't going to dissolve in many organic solvents, but it dissolves very well in D2O. The problem with that is 
if you look at the structure of sucrose, there are a lot of heteroatom protons. And when we do our spectra, we're not going to see a one of them. When, as soon as we dissolve it in D2O, every single one of those heteroatom protons is going to exchange with deuterium and vanish from the spectra. In some respects, that's not a bad thing. It simplifies the spectrum a little bit, but it does give us a very large water peak that we're going to have to deal with, because now we have a lot of HOD in there from the D2O that we dissolved it is, and all the hydrogens from the uh, OH group, so the sucrose itself. And it also means that if we have a sample that we must uh, measure accurately a alcohol or an amine chemical shift, we cannot dissolve it in a hydrogen bonded solvent like, D, like D2O or deuterated methanol. And you would have to use, hopefully it will dissolve in, either acetonitrile or DMSO or a solvent like that. And so tr choosing which solvent to use is kind of an interesting one here. Your samples, when we do NMR, do have to be dissolved. Okay, there you do have to get them into solution. Uh, there are techniques called, there is a technique called solid state NMR spectroscopy. That is a much different beast than solution phase NMR, much more difficult to do and not very commonly done. And so we're not going to talk about that and except to say that we, for our purposes, our samples do have to be dissolved and that means we have to sometimes work kind of hard to get our samples in solution and choose carefully the solvents we use.